the angler. Quote, this day Dame Nature seemed in love, the lusty sap began to move, fresh juice did stir the embracing vines, and birds had drawn their valentines. The jealous trout that low did lie rose at a well-dissembled fly. There stood my friend with patient skill, attending of his trembling quill. Unquote. Sir H. Watton it is said that many an unlucky urchin is induced to run away from his family and betake himself to a seafaring life from reading the history of Robinson Crusoe. And I suspect that, in like manner, many of those worthy gentlemen who are given to haunt the sides of pastoral streams with angle rods in hand may trace the origin of their passion to the seductive pages of honest Isaac Walton. I recollect studying his Complete Angler, several years since, in company with a knot of friends in America, and moreover, that we were all completely bitten with the angling mania. It was early in the year, but as soon as the weather was auspicious, and that the spring began to melt into the verge of summer, we took rod in hand and sallied into the country, as stark mad as was ever Don Quixote from reading books of chivalry. One of our party had equaled the dawn in the fullness of his equipments being attired cap a pie for the enterprise. He wore a broad-skirted fustian coat, perplexed with half a hundred pockets, a pair of stout shoes and leathern gaiters, a basket slung on one side for fish, a patent rod, a landing net, and a score of other inconveniences only to be found in the true angler's armory. Thus harnessed for the field, he was as great a matter of stare and wonderment among the country folk who had never seen a regular angler, as was the steel-clad hero of La Mancha among the goat herds of the Sierra Morena. Our first essay was along a mountain brook among the highlands of the Hudson, a most unfortunate place for the execution of those piscatory tactics which had been invented along the velvet margins of quiet English rivulets. It was one of those wild streams that lavish among our romantic solitudes unheeded beauties enough to fill the sketchbook of a hunter of the picturesque. Sometimes it would leap down rocky shelves, making small cascades over which the trees threw their broad balancing sprays and long nameless weeds hung in fringes from the impending banks, dripping with diamond drops. Sometimes it would brawl and fret along a ravine in the matted shade of a forest, filling it with murmurs, and after this ptarmigant career, would steal forth into open day with the most placid, demure face imaginable, as I have seen some pestilent shrew of a housewife, after filling her home with uproar and ill-humor, come dimpling out of doors, swimming and curtsying and smiling upon all the world. How smoothly would this vagrant brook glide at such times through some bosom of green meadowland among the mountains, where the quiet was only interrupted by the occasional tinkling of a bell from the lazy cattle among the clover, or the sound of a woodcutter's axe from the neighboring forest. For my part, I was always a bungler at all kinds of sport that required either patience or adroitness, and had not angled above half an hour before I had completely satisfied the sentiment, and convinced myself of the truth of Isaac Walton's opinion that angling is something like poetry, a man must be born to it. I hooked myself instead of the fish, tangled my line in every tree, lost my bait, broke my rod, until I gave up the attempt in despair, and passed the day under the trees reading old Isaac, satisfied that it was his fascinating vein of honest simplicity and rural feeling that had bewitched me, and not the passion for angling. My companions, however, were more persevering in their delusion. I have them at this moment before my eyes, stealing along the border of the brook where it lay open to the day, or was merely fringed by shrubs and bushes. I see the bittern rising with hollow scream as they break in upon his rarely invaded haunt, the kingfisher watching them suspiciously from his dry tree that overhangs the deep black mill-pond in the gorge of the hills, the tortoise letting himself slip sideways from off the stone or log on which he is sunning himself, and the panic-struck frog plumping in headlong as they approach and spreading an alarm throughout the watery world around. I recollect also that after toiling and watching and creeping about for the greater part of a day, 
with scarcely any success in spite of all our admirable apparatus, a lubberly country urchin came down from the hills with a rod made from a branch of a tree, a few yards of twine, and, as heaven shall help me, I believe, a crooked pin for a hook, baited with a vile earthworm, and in half an hour caught more fish than we had nibbles throughout the day. But above all, I recollect the good, honest, wholesome, hungry repast which we made under a beech tree just by a spring of pure sweet water that stole out of the side of a hill, and how, when it was over, one of the party read old Isaac Walton's scene with the milkmaid while I lay on the grass and built castles in a bright pile of clouds until I fell asleep. All this may appear like mere egotism, yet I cannot refrain from uttering these recollections which are passing like a strain of music over my mind and have been called up by an agreeable scene which I witnessed not long since. In the morning's stroll along the banks of the Allen, a beautiful little stream which flows down from the Welsh hills and throws itself into the Dee, my attention was attracted to a group seated on the margin. On approaching I found it to consist of a veteran angler and two rustic disciples. The former was an old fellow with a wooden leg, with clothes very much but very carefully patched, betokening poverty honestly come by and decently maintained. His face bore the marks of former storms, but present fair weather, its furrows had been worn into a habitual smile, his iron-gray locks hung about his ears, and he had altogether the good-humored air of a constitutional philosopher who was disposed to take the world as it went. One of his companions was a ragged white with the skulking look of an errant poacher, and all warrant could find his way to any gentleman's fish-pond in the neighborhood in the darkest night. The other was a tall, awkward country lad, with a lounging gait and apparently somewhat of a rustic bow. The old man was busy in examining the maw of a trout which he had just killed to discover by its contents what insects were seasonable for bait, and was lecturing on the subject to his companions, who appeared to listen with infinite deference. I have a kind feeling toward all brothers of the angle ever since I read Isaac Walton. They are men, he affirms, of a mild, sweet, and peaceable spirit, and my esteem for them has been increased since I met with an old treatise of fishing with the angle in which are set forth many of the maxims of their inoffensive fraternity. Take good heed, saith this honest little treatise, that in going about your disports ye open no man's gates, but that ye shut them again. Also ye shall not use this foresaid crafty desport for no covetousness to the increasing and sparing of your money only, but principally for your solace and to cause the health of your body and specially of your soul. Note. From this same treatise, it would appear that angling is a more industrious and devout employment than it is generally considered. For when ye purpose to go on your disports in fishing, ye will not desire greatly many persons with you which might let you off your game, and that you may serve God devoutly in saying effectually your customable prayers, and thus doing, ye shall eschew and also avoid many vices, as idleness, which is principal cause to induce man to many other vices, as it is right well known. I thought that I could perceive in the veteran angler before me an exemplification of what I had read, and there was a cheerful contentedness in his looks that quite drew me toward him. I could not but remark the gallant manner in which he stumped from one part of the brook to another, waving his rod in the air to keep the line from dragging on the ground or catching among the bushes, and the adroitness with which he would throw his fly to any particular place, sometimes skimming it lightly along a little rapid, sometimes casting it into one of those dark holes made by a twisted root or overhanging bank in which the large trout are apt to lurk. In the meanwhile he was giving instructions to his two disciples, showing them the manner in which they should handle their rods, fix their flies, and play them along the surface of the stream. The scene brought to my mind the instructions of the sage Piscator to his scholar. The country around was of that pastoral kind which Walton is fond of describing. It was a part of the great plain of Cheshire, close by the beautiful vale of Gesford, and just where the inferior Welsh hills begin to swell up from among fresh-smelling meadows. The day, too, like that recorded in his work, was mild and sunshiny, with now and then a soft dropping shower that sowed the whole earth with diamonds. 
I soon fell into conversation with the old angler, and was so much entertained that under pretext of receiving instructions in his art, I kept company with him almost the whole day, wandering along the banks of the stream and listening to his talk. He was very communicative, having all the easy gorality of cheerful old age, and I fancy was a little flattered by having an opportunity to display his piscatory lore, for who does not like now and then to play the sage? He had been much of a rambler in his day, and had passed some years of his youth in America, particularly in Savannah, where he had entered into trade and been ruined by the indiscretion of a partner. He had afterwards experienced many ups and downs in life, until he got into the Navy, where his leg was carried away by a cannonball at the Battle of Camperdown. This was the only stroke of real good fortune he had ever experienced, for it got him a pension, which, together with some small paternal property, brought him in a revenue of nearly forty pounds. On this he retired to his native village, where he lived quietly and independently, and devoted the remainder of his life to the noble art of angling. I found that he had read Isaac Walton attentively, and he seemed to have imbibed all his simple frankness and prevalent good humor. Though he had been sorely buffeted about the world, he was satisfied that the world in itself was good and beautiful. Though he had been as roughly used in different countries as a poor sheep that is fleeced by every hedge and thicket, yet he spoke of every nation with candor and kindness, appearing to look only on the good side of things. And above all, he was almost the only man I had ever met with who had been an unfortunate adventurer in America and had honesty and magnanimity enough to take the fault to his own door and not to curse the country. The lad that was receiving his instructions, I learnt, was the son and heir apparent of a fat old widow who kept the village inn, and of course a youth of some expectation, and much courted by the idle gentleman-like personages of the place. In taking him under his care, therefore, the old man had probably an eye to a privileged corner in the tap-room, and an occasional cup of cheerful ale free of expense. There is certainly something in angling, if we could forget which anglers are apt to do the cruelties and tortures inflicted on worms and insects, that tends to produce a gentleness of spirit and a pure serenity of mind. As the English are methodical even in their recreations, and are the most scientific of sportsmen, it has been reduced among them to perfect rule and system. Indeed, it is an amusement peculiarly adapted to the mild and highly cultivated scenery of England where every roughness has been softened away from the landscape. It is delightful to saunter along those limpid streams which wander like veins of silver through the bosom of this beautiful country, leading one through a diversity of small home scenery, sometimes winding through ornamented grounds, sometimes brimming along through rich pasturage, where the fresh green is mingled with sweet-smelling flowers, sometimes venturing in sight of villages and hamlets, and then running capriciously away into shady retirements. The sweetness and serenity of nature and the quiet watchfulness of the sport gradually bring on pleasant fits of musing, which are now and then agreeably interrupted by the song of a bird, the distant whistle of the peasant, or perhaps the vagary of some fish leaping out of the still water and skimming transiently about its glassy surface. When I would beget content, said Isaac Walton, and increase confidence in the power and wisdom and providence of Almighty God, I will walk the meadows by some gliding stream, and there contemplate the lilies that take no care, and those very many other little living creatures that are not only created but fed, man knows not how, by the goodness of the God of nature, and therefore trust in him. I cannot forbear to give another quotation from one of those ancient champions of angling which breathes the same innocent and happy spirit. Let me live harmlessly, and near the brink of Trent or Avon have a dwelling place where I may see my quill or cork down sink with eager bite of pike or bleak or dace, and on the world and my creator think, while some men strive ill-gotten goods to embrace, and others spend their time in base excess of wine or worse, in war or wantonness. Let them that will these pastimes still pursue, and on such pleasing fancies feed their fill, so I the fields and meadows green may view, and daily by fresh rivers walk at will, among the daisies and the violets blue, red hyacinth and yellow daffodil. J. Davers On parting with the old angler, I inquired after his place of abode, and happening to be in the neighborhood of the village a few evenings afterwards, I had the curiosity to seek him out. I found him living in a small cottage containing only one room, 
but a perfect curiosity in its method and arrangement. It was on the skirts of the village, on a green bank a little back from the road, with a small garden in front stocked with kitchen herbs and adorned with a few flowers. The whole front of the cottage was overrun with honeysuckle. On the top was a ship for a weathercock. The interior was fitted up in a truly nautical style, his ideas of comfort and convenience having been acquired on the berth deck of a man-of-war. A hammock was slung from the ceiling, which in the daytime was lashed up so as to take but little room. From the center of the chamber hung a model of a ship, of his own workmanship. Two or three chairs, a table, and a large sea chest formed the principal movables. About the wall were stuck-up naval ballads, such as Admiral Hosier's Ghost, All in the Downs, and Tom Bowling. Intermingled with pictures of sea fights, among which the Battle of Camperdown held a distinguished place. The mantelpiece was decorated with seashells over which hung a quadrant flanked by two woodcuts of most bitter-looking naval commanders. His implements for angling were carefully disposed on nails and hooks about the room. On a shelf was arranged his library, containing a work on angling, much worn, a Bible covered with canvas, an odd volume or two of voyages, a nautical almanac, and a book of songs. His family consisted of a large black cat with one eye, and a parrot which he had caught and tamed and educated himself in the course of one of his voyages, and which uttered a variety of sea phrases with the hoarse brattling tone of a veteran boatswain. The establishment reminded me of that of the renowned Robinson Crusoe. It was kept in neat order, everything being stowed away with the regularity of a ship of war, and he informed me that he scoured the deck every morning and swept it between meals. I found him seated on a bench before the door, smoking his pipe in the soft evening sunshine. His cat was purring soberly on the threshold, and his parrot describing some strange evolutions in an iron ring that swung in the center of his cage. He had been angling all day and gave me a history of his sport with as much minuteness as a general would talk over a campaign, being particularly animated in relating the manner in which he had taken a large trout, which had completely tasked all his skill and wariness and which he had sent as a trophy to mine hostess of the inn. How comforting it is to see a cheerful and contented old age, and to behold a poor fellow like this, after being tempest-tossed through life, safely moored in a snug and quiet harbor in the evening of his days. His happiness, however, sprung from within himself, and was independent of external circumstances, for he had that inexhaustible good nature which is the most precious gift of heaven, spreading itself like oil over the troubled sea of thought, and keeping the mind smooth and equable in the roughest weather. On inquiring further about him, I learnt that he was a universal favorite in the village and the oracle of the taproom, where he delighted the rustics with his songs, and, like Sinbad, astonished them with his stories of strange lands and shipwrecks and sea fights. He was much noticed, too, by gentlemen sportsmen of the neighborhood, had taught several of them the art of angling, and was a privileged visitor to their kitchens. The whole tenor of his life was quiet and inoffensive, being principally passed about the neighboring streams when the weather and season were favorable, and at other times he employed himself at home, preparing his fishing tackle for the next campaign, or manufacturing rods, nets, and flies for his patrons and pupils among the gentry. He was a regular attendant at church on Sundays, though he generally fell asleep during the sermon. He had made it his particular request that when he died he should be buried in a green spot which he could see from his seat in church, and which he had marked out ever since he was a boy, and had thought of when far from home on the raging sea in danger of being food for the fishes. It was the spot where his father and mother had been buried. I have done, for I fear that my reader is growing weary, but I could not refrain from drawing the picture of this worthy brother of the angle, who has made me more than ever in love with the theory, though I fear I shall never be adroit in the practice of his art. And I will conclude this rambling sketch in the words of honest Isaac Walton, by craving the blessing of St. Peter's master upon my reader, and upon all that are true lovers of virtue, and dare trust in his providence, and be quiet, and go a-angling. <laughs>